Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being with us today. We're going to get started a couple minutes early. Uh, my name is Tim Holbert. I'm Executive Director of the American Veterans Center, and uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, this is our 20th year of this event, so it's, uh, it's a very special year for us, and uh, we're very happy you're here. Um, of course, we really want to thank the Navy Memorial for their hospitality for this weekend. Uh, they've been great partners for us over the years. Um, uh, my only word that I really have to kick things off this morning is really for all the students that are with us here this weekend. Uh, I really encourage you to take all of this in um, from where we start with veterans of the Battle of Midway 75 years ago uh, through 75 years of uh, American military history. This is your own past and present, and you're our future. So uh, this is a great opportunity and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and, and really make the most of it. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome um, uh, Admiral Frank Thorpe, President of the Navy Memorial, just to say a few words of welcome before we get started. Admiral Thorpe. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Navy Memorial. Uh, as you all know, uh, our mission here is to honor, recognize, and celebrate the men and women of the sea services, past, present, and future, and to educate uh, the American public about your all service. So it's, it's actually a, a tremendous honor for us to be here. And on a day like today, we use the term sea services, but in the end, we're all, we're in it, uh, we're all in it together. And uh, I think uh, these gentlemen right here represent uh, the idea of being all in it together. And I just want to say one thing about why I'm honored and why we're honored to be here today and the opportunity you all have to. You know, when I looked at, uh, at the program here uh, and, and I look at words like trailblazers, legends, these are, these are in the agenda. The last ace, leadership, saving lives, the greatest generation, the medal of honor why we fought, valor, witness to history, and right here, the turn of the tide. Um, it is an honor for us to be here. I hope you all uh, really get a lot out of the next couple days because, uh, as was just mentioned, this is an, literally an opportunity of a lifetime uh, that we have in the next couple days uh, to be able to listen to these great Americans uh, who literally uh, gave of themselves uh, and set an example and paved a path for us all to walk on. So welcome to the Navy Memorial. I hope you appreciate the hospitality. And when I say that, I hope that what I'm really saying is I hope we make the hospitality as great as it possibly can be uh, to make your all's uh, experience as great as it can be in the next two days. Thank you very much. Great, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Craig Horn, who will be our MC throughout the day, to introduce the first panel. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. My name is Craig Horn. This is, uh, I think, maybe my 20th year as well with the uh, annual American Veterans Conference. This morning, we're going to begin an adventure as we look back so that we can see further ahead. It's often been said that ignorance of the past can create irresponsibility in the present and recklessness in the future. So this morning we're going to begin with the Battle of Midway. It's my pleasure to introduce Richard B. Frank. Richard Frank is an internationally recognized historian of the Asian Pacific War. He was consultant for the HBO World War II special on the Pacific. And in that he wrote, and I quote, the Pacific War will inspire a long overdue reawakening of the strategic importance, sheer scale, and unsurpassed savagery of the wars unleashed by Japan. The Battle of Midway was the turning of the tide. Please welcome Mr. Richard B. Frank. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for those kind remarks. We're here in the 75th year anniversary of the Battle of Midway. It is a perennial on the perennial list of the most important battles of World War II. It's often cited as the single, single most important uh, naval battle in the United States naval history. It's uh, usually listed as among the most decisive naval battles in all of history. Uh, it is an enthralling story that's been told and well told a number of times. 
Uh, we obviously don't have time to go into all the details of it today. But in a very sparse outline, let me point out the battle ultimately, from our perspective, was one of a great triumph against odds. Its foundation was intelligence, particularly radio intelligence developed by American uh, officers with British and Australian support. The key figure in this is uh, Lieutenant Commander Joseph Rochford, who was a radio intelligence officer in Pearl Harbor for Admiral Nimitz, the Commander in Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Joe Rochford is now a legendary figure. He's better remembered than many dozens of admirals who served in World War II. He is also, I would submit to you, those of you who are students, an inspiration, those of you who are feeling that your efforts are not properly uh, appreciated. You should remember always that when Joe Rochford was an officer training program in 1919, one of his evaluators wrote, this individual should not be entrusted with important responsibilities. The information that Rochford provided enabled Admiral uh, Chester Nimitz to station his carriers off the island of Midway. Decades after the event, we learned that there is more backstory to this than we knew at the time. Uh, Admiral, uh, President Roosevelt had appointed <laughs> Admiral uh, Nimitz as Commander in Chief of the Pacific mm -hmm. Fleet, but Nimitz's immediate boss, Ernest J. King, the Commander in Chief of the U.S. Fleet, quite bluntly did not think Nimitz was fit for the job and showed it in various ways. And in the weeks leading up to the Battle of Midway, Nimitz and King were in conflict over what the Japanese move was going to be. King, based on his radio intelligence people, believed the Japanese were going to the South Pacific. Nimitz believed it was Midway was the target. And he was in the individual position of explaining to his uh, doubtful boss why he was right and his boss was wrong, which he did. The battle itself was uh, commanded uh, by Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher and Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, both of whom did very well. But above all, it was a battle ultimately that came down to the professionalism, the skill, and the sheer valor of the air groups and the ship's complements of our task forces off Midway. Uh, most notably, our aviators suffered tremendous losses, both those who flew from Midway and those who flew from the uh, carriers. Uh, among those were uh, the members of Torpedo Squadron 8 off of Hornet. Uh, they launched 15 aircraft that morning. All 15 were shot down, and of 30 crewmen, only one survived. Uh, only six of 41 torpedo planes that flew that morning uh, returned to an American flight deck. And the dive bombers also suffered very heavily in securing that victory. But we are fortunate today to have with us uh, three actual veterans of the battle. Uh, I talked to them beforehand, and there is a sort of a natural chronology, I think, to uh, the sequence of their uh, recollections about that event. And so, uh, without further ado, we're going to go to that, and I'm going to move through that. And we also had uh, scheduled this morning uh, Captain uh, uh, Jack Crawford, uh, who unfortunately is not yet here with us today. And we'll, uh, I'm sorry, John Crawford. Uh, should he get here in time, maybe we'll have a chance to hear from him. But we're going to start with uh, Jack Holder, who in 1941 and 1942 uh, was with uh, Patrol Squadron 23, VP 23. Uh, Jack, uh, and in, as a matter of fact, you were uh, with the squadron at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. That's correct. Yeah. VP-23, I, I joined uh, December 12, 1940. And then you all uh, deployed from there to Midway Island uh, for the Battle of Midway? I got to Midway on May 26, 1942, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so your aircraft... Uh, your, it, he was flying in a uh, Catalina PBY, which was a high-wing twin-engine patrol bomber. Uh, it had great range. It also had considerable vulnerability if it ran into Japanese uh, Zero fighter aircraft. Yes. Uh, and your your position on the aircraft was as flight engineer. And what what did what did that involve? What does that involve? Well, years ago, uh, aircraft uh, were built. Uh, they had an engineer's panel that required uh, a lot of instrumentation, controls, and everything, unlike airplanes today. And the aircraft today is mostly, mostly controlled. The pilot has all of them. Uh, PBY, the pilot couldn't even start a PBY without the flight engineer. And so these controls were like for the engine and the fuel system and things like that. Everything. You were monitoring that. Yeah. So actually, I didn't know that the flight engineer actually started a PBY. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, his uh, aircraft was not just one of uh, the search aircraft that would fly a critical mission at the Battle of Midway. It flew arguably uh, the most important mission that morning. 
because of the intelligence that we've been provided, uh, the PBYs have been uh, set up to conduct searches in certain sectors where the Japanese carriers were expected. Uh, but actually, the, there was an aircraft ahead of you, right, that saw the incoming Japanese flight. I was in the second aircraft when the, the, we, uh, we left Midway on a deviation of seven degrees, and the pilot to the plane to our left spotted the fleet first. When they report a position, we flew to that position, seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you all reported the presence of two Japanese carriers. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I should point out that um, although there were four Japanese carriers in their in their carrier task force, this initial sighting of only uh, only saw two of them initially, and this would cause some ripples in the American command decisions during the day because they knew there should be four carriers present. Uh, what was interesting when I, we were talking about this, of course, you know, there's this moment when you see uh, the Japanese uh, carriers, but you continue on with your mission uh, for hours after oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I flew 13 hours that day. Yeah. And in fact, uh, as you're, you all are flying that mission, you don't know what's going on at Midway. That's right. <clears throat> we, late in the afternoon, we lost all contact with Midway. We didn't know if we still controlled it or if the Japanese had it. Mm -hmm. Their, their bombing attack that morning had knocked out the radio, and yeah. you, got, you guys could not pick up anything. No. So you didn't know who held Midway at that That's point. That's right. That's right. So what did you all do? Well, we continued to search and uh, do exactly what we were supposed to do when we went out. Uh, uh, we reported uh, uh, several missions, several ships. Uh, Late in early in the afternoon, we uh, we struck gold. We we caught a submarine uh, attempting to submerge. All hatches were closed. No one was on deck. We dropped the first 500 pounder on a fan tail, made a circle, and dropped a, a, another five right behind the conning tower. Made six circles around it, watching it sink. Mm -hmm. We had a great day. Yeah. So. But uh, since you didn't know what was going on at Midway, what did, what did you all do at, uh, towards the end of the mission then? Well, uh, later on, after we found out that we lost all contact, uh, we had an, had an option. We could take a chance on going back to Midway, or we could sit down at sea. Uh, it was unanimous. We sat down at sea, threw out a sea anchor, drifted all night. I took a sleeping bag, climbed on top of the wing, tied myself to an antenna, and spent the night. <laughs> it's uh, sun up. We finally made contact with Midway. We learned that we had been successful. We also were told there was a destroyer at the French frigate Shoals loaded with aviation fuel. <clears throat> we took navigational sun shots, found a position, flew to the Shoals, refueled, went to Midway. And then uh, that day, uh, also part of the missions that PBYs flew at the battle was a after some of the main action, we're searching for our downed air crew. We spent all of, all of the next day searching air crew. Late in the afternoon, we found two gentlemen in a live raft, but we were low on fuel at that time. We radioed a sister ship. They landed, picked up the gentlemen, took them in the midway. Very good. Let me, uh, let me go on now to Bill Norberg. Uh, Bill? Uh, Tell us about how long you were on the Enterprise. Well, I went aboard the Enterprise in September 1941, and I stayed in, on, until August of 45 when the bomb was dropped at Nagasaki. And how many commanding officers did you have to break in? Nine. Nine. <laughs> and your actual job on the Enterprise during that period, can you describe how you moved through those jobs? Well, I started out as, an, as a seaman first class or maybe as yeoman third class, I'm not sure which. A yeoman is the secretary in the Navy. And uh, I worked in the captain's office the, my entire term aboard the Enterprise there. And uh, through a bunch of uh, successive <coughs> successes, I was able to move rapidly and I became, uh, I was put in charge of the office when I became a first class yeoman. And I kept that job when I became a chief and had that job for about 23 months. So you had the whole war on what's probably the most famous ship in the U.S. Navy's history, the USS Enterprise. Amen, brother. Amen. Okay. He's, uh, <clears throat> I should point out, for historians, someone like this is, is a wonderful person. 
because he's near the, the great and powerful as they talk and make decisions. And you can go to people like this and find out what really happened as opposed to what is in the memoir or the recollection later from the admiral or whatever here. Uh, before we get to Midway, you had a, had a story I, I wanted to have you share with people. Uh, this is on the transit. Uh, Enterprise is going with Hornet to deliver the Doolittle Raiders. Yes, sir. And you're cruising through. Uh, it's dark and it's foggy. Yes, and you had a little encounter with one of the high and mighty. Well, I did. I had delivered a message from the captain up to the Admiral's bridge. The Admiral not being there, I left it with his orderly, good friend of mine, by the way. I started climbing down the, the ladder, and instead of hitting that hard steel catwalk, I hit something kind of soft, and about that time I heard a voice say to me, damn you. I recognized William F. Bull Halsey. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of shivering my shoes, but I took off like a shot after I said yes, sir, to him, and he never caught me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here the last surviving American seaman who outran Admiral Halsey. <laughs> I have more little incidents oh, there on the same there where I was, I was standing the midnight watch and it was feeling kind of sleepy and I went out on the port wing of the bridge there and leaned my head against the bulkhead there and doggone I didn't lean against the general quarters alarm and wake up the whole <laughs> ship. <laughs> <laughs> and boy I'll tell you I scooted in somebody said I don't know who but he had, was wearing a pea coat. <laughs> the resourcefulness with which our armed forces are known. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the actual battle itself. So you're, uh, uh, you're up with the captain yes, on the captain's bridge, whatever right. here. Yeah. So you're there all day long. Yes, sir. Okay, so you see the, you hear the messages? Yes, I did. And which ones, do you remember any particular messages? About 9.30 in the morning. I understand from this gentleman right here that his message came through. Japanese fleet spotted, including <coughs> two carriers, from my recollection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you saw the takeoff of the Enterprise aircraft, I assume. Oh, they uh, wasn't but very little bit before the admirals said, everybody take off. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, there on the, uh, uh, on the uh, bridge, and of course, uh, eventually the aircraft come back. And there's not as many coming back as went out. That's exactly right. <coughs> And you were t when we were talking about this, uh, this relationship of the air group and the ship's company is very close. Yes, sir. And tell us a little bit about how the reaction of the crew was uh, when the aircraft come back. Well, uh, first of all, the, re the ready room scene was very bad. I didn't hear of any tears being shed, but it was very close to that. The, and among the torpedo squadron, first of all, we sent out 14 torpedo bombers. Only four came back. And uh, it was bad. Mm -hmm. and, but then again, as our planes came back, many, many, many had failed to make it. I think probably there were 20 some all together from the Enterprise that were, were unable to come back. And uh, Every, every one of us could feel that we were losing something great. And you mentioned uh, the, uh, among the flyers, uh, two, of the, two of the most successful and famous and uh, admired, uh, Dusty Kleiss and, uh, and uh, Dick Best. Do you remember those, uh, gentlemen? Oh, yes. I quite remember, or I remember them quite well. Uh, Dick Best, for instance, he was a skipper of the uh, b bombing group, and he led the attack on the carrier Akagi. For some strange reason, there was a mix-up that occurred, and probably uh, 28 or 29 planes attacked the uh, carrier Kaga, and only three attacked the Akagi. And uh, Best led the way, and he just made a perfect dive and landed his 1,000-pound bomb in, in one of the most uh, vulnerable, vulnerable spots on that carrier. The bomb went down through the flight deck, detonated in, in the hangar deck, and what should they have there but a full complement of Japanese torpedo planes up 
armed to the teeth, and it was just a uh, holocaust waiting to happen, and that's what happened. And then he went out, he would fly a second mission despite the fact he had very serious problems. Well, he did, sir. Uh, that, he was batting a thousand at that point, and he went out later that afternoon, his plane ha not having been shot up very badly, and he went out and helped attack the last surviving carrier, the Hear You. And, uh, and he uh, scored another hit, which gave him a thousand batting average. He never flew again for the Navy after that. Unfortunately, he'd had a, an oxygen problem, and he inhaled some caustic soda, which resulted in a rapid case of tuberculosis. Took him several years to recover from it, but he retired from the Navy, recovered from that, and lived a very productive civilian life until the year 2001. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to meet him, and, and as, as Bill says, I mean, you know, in, this, in the Enterprise uh, dive bomber groups, there were two squadrons, and as Bill said, what, what happened when they saw the Japanese carriers below, there was a mix-up. Uh, the lead squadron was supposed to go to the far carrier. The trailing squadron was supposed to go to the uh, trailing carrier. They all started diving on the carrier. They had the presence of mind to realize that this would leave the other carrier, which turned out to be the Japanese flagship, the Akagi. And he led his three, his, uh, his little group and scored his hit. not scored that hit in the Akagi, the Akagi would have uh, continued on through the battle. So he's truly one of the great heroes of the battle. And Dusty Kleiss, uh, whose memoir was recently published, uh, uh, although Dick Best is uh, 1,000, uh, Dusty was uh, only three out of four in his dive. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He he hit uh, he hit the uh, Kaga. Uh, he hit the Hear You. Hear you. And he hit the Makuma. Makuma. And, and four dives or whatever here. His wonderful memoir called uh, uh, "Never Call Me a Hero" just came out. Uh, now, uh, you stayed aboard the Enterprise for the whole war. So the Enterprise's uh, I, I guess greatest moments were to come later in the year oh, around Guadalcanal. Uh, so let me stop there, whatever, here, and, and uh, rest, rest your heels. So let me go now to John, and uh, he was aboard the Yorktown. All right. Okay. Uh, and tell, tell us about when you got to the Yorktown. <clears throat> well, I joined the Navy like these fellas and prior to the war. I was in high school out in Georgia, and I had to cross the street to get on the school bus and stand in front of the post office and they had this big sign with a pilot with goggles and standing on the wing of an airplane with a, a parachute hanging and it said, high school graduates, join the Navy and learn to fly. Well, that was for me. And cut my story short, it was uh, in ladder 43 before I got flight training in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. But anyway, I graduated from boot camp on Friday, December the 3rd, 1941, down here at Norfolk. And Sunday, the Japs blew a hole in my orders to go to Pensacola. And they sent all of us guys uh, to the fleet that had returned from the North Atlantic Patrol. And the Yorktown was a dry dock in Newport News, and the first carrier I ever saw, first large ship. So we went aboard and issued us dungarees and gave us chipping hammers so we got underneath the Yorktown and scraped the barnacles and grass off it. Uh, then we went to sea, went around through the Florida Straits, the canal up to San Diego, and arrived there the day after Christmas and stayed a couple of days and took a convoy of Marines, a whole battalion down to Samoa and dropped them off. We didn't go in, me and the carrier, and we, our little battle fleet, uh, two cruisers and four destroyers, we went west, and another carrier battle fleet came over the horizon, and an SBD, a scout bomber Douglas, uh, took off and landed on our ship, and this guy got out in the back seat, you talked about Halsey, and I'm a sky lookout, and I'm, what on watch it, I was looking down at the deck and this guy got out of the plane, this plane handler, a seaman like myself, 
uh, slapped him on the back and said, hey, chief, that was a good landing. And he took his way west off it. Had three stars on there. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, had come up to confer with our Admiral uh, Fletcher, Black Jack Fletcher, they called him. Uh, and they got their heads together and without approval from us deck force types, <laughs> we went and bombed the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, which was the first retaliatory strike of the war. Uh, and then we went to Pearl Harbor. And we got there on February the 2nd and bodies were still breaking loose from the wreckage and floating to the surface and oil and all sorts of mess uh, over and so people like me who had, a, if you want to speak to someone with a little authority on Yorktown CV-5, they'd send you to see me because I had as little as anybody. <laughs> Being an apprentice seaman, we uh, were sent on working parties and these bodies, we'd run a canvas under, you couldn't touch them, and I hate to tell you this, but we'd roll them in. And we developed a great hate for our Japanese friends boys were killed, a lot of them in their bunks. So we stayed there for a while and we gathered up our skirts and went down to the Carl Sea. And we were underway for 104 days. And we fought the Battle of the Carl Sea with the old Lex. And uh, Lex got sunk, we got shot up. Uh, and we went down to an island called Tonga Tabu, which is about a thousand miles due east of Australia. Uh, and got everybody settled in, and we got a message from uh, Pearl Harbor. Back then they called it Commander-in-Chief, something that was spelled sick of, C-I-N-C-U-S, so they decided that wasn't very good for morale. They changed <laughs> it. But we got a message that says, Buster Pearl. So away we went, and I remember standing back on the near the roundel on the after end of the flight deck watching us pave a oil streak all the way to Pearl, and we were concerned that the Japanese submarines would find that streak and follow us. But we went into Pearl, went around Fort Island, right into dry dock, and it got rid of the likes of me and brought professionals aboard. I never saw so many shipyard workers. We were told to get out of there in 72 hours. Admiral Nimitz was down with his staff walking into dry dock with waders on. They hadn't gotten all the water out. So 72 hours later, and I'm, if I'm getting ahead of you, let, let me let me just uh, just briefly, uh, as uh, John said, uh, Yorktown was hit by several bombs at Coral Sea. Originally, they thought it was be about a three-week job in a in a navy yard to repair, but Admiral Nimitz at this point had realized that uh, the Japanese were going to make this main effort at Midway, so he ordered Yorktown back to Pearl Harbor and gave the dockyard people the orders that. She has to be ready for sea in three days or 72 hours. It was an right. absolutely frantic uh, effort, as you can well imagine, to, to do all of this. Our other uh, Yorktown veteran, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Crawford, uh, in fact, reported aboard at this time. He was just an ensign fresh out of uh, Annapolis. And uh, he, he told me that you know, when he reported aboard, he was sent to the executive officer to get his assignment and which was Jocko Clark at the time. Yeah, and so uh, the executive officer was absolutely exhausted, but we know now this was like ultimate frenzy in order to get the ship repaired, uh, replenished, uh, everything set to go in three days or whatever here. So he sent uh, Mr. Mr. He told Mr. Crawford simply to find his place on some watch bill somewhere. That they get back to him later. He was trained as a radar officer, but he was never going to see a radar on the on the Yorktown or whatever here. Sort of a supernumerary, but. Uh, uh, what I wanted to do, uh, John, is uh, I want you to describe where your battle station was during the battle. Okay, let me insert something sure, for your sure. record. The Battle of Midway <clears throat> would have been fought with six carriers, the same six carriers that bombed Pearl Harbor. We sank one and heavily damaged the other two. So they only had four carriers up there, thanks to the Battle of the Coral Sea. And the Enterprise was our sister ship. Uh, so we're right proud of the Enterprise. She was the one that lucked out. She was the only one of the original group of the Yorktown class to survive. So anyway, we got underway at the, at the end of the 72 hours. They worked day and night. 
And we were going out to slot between uh, Molokai and Oahu, recovering planes. And we take the fighter group board first. And a fighter squadron landed first, naturally. And a young ensign came, and he dropped his nose and built a little airspeed and floated it on top of him. And his propeller just chopped him up in meatballs and left streaks of blood on the superstructure. His son is a Naval Academy graduate, retired from the Navy, lives in Charleston. And we see him every June the 4th when we have the reunion. Anyway, we went on out because Nimitz had told us to take position 150 miles northeast of Midway, which he called Point Luck. And our skipper, our Admiral, Admiral Fletcher, was SOPA, Senior Officer President of Float at that time. And the one you had on the Enterprise, uh, it wound up uh, taking over after we got shot up. I was like getting ahead of myself. But anyway, on the day of June the 4th, I was a sky lookout, and I could hear the admiral and the captain talking just down below me. And we heard the PBY, the first one, say uh, uh, they had spotted uh, main force, they call it, and nothing else. So I heard that. I said, well, where in the hell are they? So later on, we got another message, I guess, from your PBY that they had spotted two carriers. So we knew that the Japs were. So Admiral Fletcher he said, signal the Enterprise, because they had the rear admiral on board then, was second in command to him, and telling the launch full deck load from the Enterprise and all. as soon as we recover our scouts, because we had the scout duty that day, and so anyway, they launched it. Our scouts returned. Let me just interject there. That, this is one of the details about the battle that sometimes gets confused. Uh, the Yorktown had launched the local surge with their scout bombers, their SPDs yes. that morning, so she did not have her deck already spotted for the launch like Enterprise and Hornet did, which is why Fletcher tells Admiral Bruins over in the Enterprise to go ahead and launch. And he says, well, follow that. that the Yorktown had to recover the scouts first before they could launch their aircraft. And actually, honestly, the Yorktown air group was better organized and functioned at the, at the battle than any other air group at that time. And they were able to get uh, their strikes up, uh, which fortuitously are going to arrive over the Japanese carriers at the time the Enterprise does. But uh, by this time, are you are you back with the 50 caliber at this point now? No, uh, when they launched an aircraft, we were general quarters all day, uh, and, and uh, I was a sky lookout, and we were in the chair a half hour, and out a half hour, and then a half hour, and then off, and then I went back to my gun. At the Coral Sea battle, I had a water cooled 50 caliber on the forecastle. We didn't have hurricane bows in those days, except for the Saratoga and the electric. So the, uh, the bow stuck out about 30 feet on the flight deck, and on the port side was a 50 caliber, and the middle was a, was a gun mount with two 20 millimeters, and on the starboard side was a 50 caliber. So when Carl C., I was up there, and being born and raised down south where we hunt quail and doves and anything else that moves, I guess, I had learned to lead. My daddy taught me how to lead quail. So they said I did pretty good in the Carl C. I don't know whether I did or not, because everybody's shooting at the same time. So they gave me a larger field of fire and sent me up on the after end of the island structure under the after director. So I had a 50 caliber, and I could cover a part of the starboard quarter and all the way forward on the port quarter. Let me, let me move us along a little bit here on, in this, because you're, you're at that station. Uh, the Japanese retaliate after we knocked out their three carriers. The remaining carrier, the Horyu, here you launches dive bombers and then a second strike of torpedo planes. And this second strike of torpedo planes is, is, are the well, you actually, you're going to fire at all of them, but the torpedo plane attack was particularly spectacular from your yeah. perspective. The first strike that hit us was dive bomber. And they came in, of course, we were zigzagging, and they came in more or less on the starboard side, and I couldn't fire 
because the directory was there. And this one plane, I, I was looking up in the 1.1s and the 20s and the 50s and firing at them. This one plane, I was looking at him and the wing broke off. And I heard it just like you'd take a plank and break it over your knee. His wing came off and a bomb came out from underneath. Uh, and it evidently didn't have a vein because it tumbled in over it and went right past my face and hit the flight deck by the number two elevator. Wiped out a bunch of guys. My boot camp friend, I could talk about it for years, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it knocked me out. And when I came to, uh, my loader was shooting at the plane and I pushed him outside and went back to fire. The reason I tell you that is later on they found out my lung had collapsed and I had shrapnel in my neck and leg. But we just fired like that. See, a battle at sea, as most of you know, it's like a thunderstorm. Storming. ...side, firing at them. And tell us, can you see the actual torpedo strike up? You want to tell us what you saw there. Yeah, they came in and bunk master was forward around and they came in on our fourth quarter and the uh, Marines had uh, 20 millimeters along the cap off and I'm firing over their head and I can see these guys coming everybody shooting at them and one of the torpedo planes dropped his fish pulled right up my face I thought he was going to fly in so I know, he didn't drop I'll never know because I, I almost emptied the canister in his face and he turned Went down alongside the island structure and disappeared. And I like a quick sea story about that. Ruth Ann and I met the guy, Fuchita, later on down at the 50th anniversary, and he, he said that was him. Anyway, get back to the fire <laughs> and the torpedoes were coming in, and I just stopped firing at the plane because so they were dropping and started firing at the torpedoes. The kid like didn't do any good, but they hit the fourth quarter. And the catwalk went up like that, and those four Marines started to end over in and splash in the water on the flight deck. And they hit the ship, and it was like you take you, take you, and those and put a bit of bucket in that whole ship, and then we this came to halt. We had stopped earlier from the bomb and had just gotten underway, and the signal flag says, by speed, 18 knots. So we couldn't get away from the torpedoes like we did, I, I, Carl. So. I'm going to have to rope us in here at this point because I want to move move on to Mr. Walsh and then. Uh, I'll shut my big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> your, your mouth was doing just fine, as the rest of you. Uh, now, uh, George, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right here, whatever here. Uh, George had some comments he wanted to make about the context of Midway, and also about a proposal he had and. Uh, it, I'll let you let you go, but uh, we're down to about eleven minutes here. Oh, babe, I don't know where to begin because I prepared what I was going to say, but I listened to these gentlemen, and in some ways there are some things that they have said that I disagree with, and I'd like to begin debating. But we're not here to debate, debate. on the table. Yeah, we're yeah. debate. Yeah. We're here this with the audience. This is not debate. No debate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was a. Um, I bomb a pilot, but I was not at the Battle of Midway. Uh, I came along a bit later. At the time of Midway, I was uh, training in Pensacola. Uh, but I was a dive bomber. And in 1989, we had a reunion of our squadron out in Chicago. And I began wondering why there was nothing written up about the dive bombers at the Battle of Midway. Everything was about the torpedo bombers. There was no book about dive bombing. There was no description of it. The military channel gave reports on weapons uh, of every nation from the one of time, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the British the submarines, the SEALs. Everything was written up, but never anything in detail about the technique and the, uh, the power of dive bombing. And that still exists. There's still nothing. Uh, 
Dusty's book that just came out, his biography, is the first book that gives any uh, account of dive bombing at all. And at that time, I began to wonder why. And uh, I started researching. So for the past 25 years, 27 years, I've been researching the Battle of Midway. And I've come to the conclusion that there's still a lot to be told. There's still a lot that has not been disclosed about what happened. And uh, there's a lot of misinformation out. And particularly the information has been put out by the authors of the 21st century since the turn of the year 2000. We've had books put out about the Battle of Midway, and I disagree with what they've had to say. But um, having said that, uh, I urge you to look at the blogs that I have on Google. I have 10 blogs up and running about the Battle of Midway, and they have a lot of information. Uh, in fact, their uh, uh, page views are from the Russians. I get as many page views from the Russians as I do from the United States. I think maybe they uh, consider me a dissident. <laughs> Uh, because in some ways, I do su disagree with the official uh, status of the Battle of Midway as far as the Navy is concerned. George, if, if I could move you on here. I, when we talked on the phone, you, you talked yeah, about Yeah, let me that, go that back. To, I'll get right on that. Yeah, would you, would you do yeah. that? Because we're yeah. the clock is really ticking yeah. now. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if all of us who are here today could do more to honor the veterans of the Battle of Midway? We can. We need a new Battle of Midway film. The film Midway of 1976 with Henry Fonda, uh, Colin Heston, uh, does not do justice to, to the importance of the Battle of uh, Midway. The, um, the battle was not only important, it was a desperate gamble. and. Uh, the story really has never been fully told. At the time of the Battle of Midway, the Japanese had advanced through the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean and were threatening uh, the British at Suez. Uh, they sank the British carriers, British uh, capital ships, the Prince of Wales and Repulse in the China Sea uh, shortly after Pearl Harbor. In February, they went all the way down to Australia, and they sank a bunch of merchant ships in the harbor of Port Darwin, Australia. Again, in February of 1942, they annihilated nine cruisers and 18 destroyers of the British, American, and Dutch Asiatic fleet at the Battle of Java Sea. And, and the, and the Australians were there, too. If I don't mention that, my Australian passport will be canceled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, uh, April of 1942, just before Pearl, uh, before Midway, uh, they had five carriers that entered the Indian Ocean, and they drove the remnants of the British Navy out of the Indian Ocean. They went as far, uh, raided as far as Madagascar. They sank the British carrier Hermes and its escort. They raided uh, Colombo and Trinco Mali, sank dozens of merchant ships, and uh, they also destroyed all the tankers that were carrying oil from the Mideast that were headed for America to fuel our war machine and our mil military. <clears throat> that access to Mideast oil was vital for America. And um, the German war staff had a report to Hitler on February 13th, 1942. If Germany and Japan join hands at the Indian Ocean, the final victory should not be far off. I guess the point I'm making is that the Battle of Midway was not about the Japanese and the US and the Pacific. It was a world affected all of World War II. It affected North Africa, it affected Russia, it affected China. Uh, there was a threat to cut off the lead-lease supply of, from the U.S. 
to the British troops at Suez, to the Stalingrad troops of Russia, and to the Chinese through the Burma Road. It had a worldwide effect. It was extremely uh, significant. Uh, at an April 14th, 1942, midnight meeting of the British Defense Commission, Field Marshal Lord Allenbrook spoke. If Japan's advance along the southern shores of Asia was not halted, it would cut off three quarters of a million fighting men in the Middle East and bring about the dreaded junction. It bring about the dreaded junction of the Axis partners. Turkey would be surrounded, and the Russian oil supplies in the Caucasus would be threatened. After the war. Churchill called that spring of 1942 the most dangerous moment of the war. The greatest most dangerous moment of the war where they were facing defeat at the hands of the Germans and the Japanese if they could combine. Churchill appealed to Roosevelt. He needed help. Roosevelt replied, came in several forms, but I believe that one of the uh, answers that uh, were given by Roosevelt was the Battle of Midway. There was really no other reason to fight the Battle of Midway. Let me, uh, let me, uh, give our clock, uh, I, George has made a, a really critical point, which is that we tend often to think of Midway as simply something that happened in the Pacific between Japan and the U.S. It's related to the Pacific War. But it truly had, uh, just as he described, uh, ripples about Allied strategy all across the globe. In fact, uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was then a chief planner for General Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, wrote a memo in February of 45 where he said the three essentials for winning the war were keeping the British in, the Russians in, and preventing a link-up of Japan and Germany across the Indian Ocean. So this reinforces the same point that others saw, that if the Japanese and the Germans had achieved this link-up, it would have, at a minimum, protracted the war enormously. It would have had a tremendous ripple effect on Allied strategy and what could be done in Europe uh, for the war. Uh, we've, uh, we, we're down now to just a, a couple minutes left. Uh, and I wanted to say that I much appreciate uh, our panelists today. I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two quick questions. So if anyone has any uh, question to ask anybody on the panel, I'd prefer to entertain at this point. Yes, right here. Oh. I think we'll be down to one question and then we'll, we'll hold it out. George, could you talk a little bit about uh, intelligence and particularly the code breaking and how that contributed to the to the success in the battle? That's that's more than a <laughs> uh, quite simply the Japanese main naval code, which we call JN twenty five B, was kept in place for much longer than necessary. That gave us time to break through the ciphers to the code itself, extract. And you can't emphasize enough that they're not reading complete messages. Mm -hmm. They're getting little bits and pieces of it. And that's where Rochefort's great genius was, to take from those little bits and pieces and see the bigger pattern of the thing. Uh, I think now, in view of our other panel, we're going to have to uh, call it uh, an end. Uh, once again, thank the panelists. And I believe uh, they deserve a salute as some very great Americans. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We greatly appreciate it. We're going to take about a two or three minute break as we reset the stage and then uh, move on into our next panel.